welcome back to this new episode of the watchmaking road trip and while we visited some pretty big and prestigious names of the watchmaking industry it's now time for you and our guys to see something completely different yes today we are staying in the Ballet de Joux home of complicated watchmaking and we're going to visit a man who is considered a living legend of watchmaking and represents what traditional watchmaking is all about so I have a little surprise for you guys today we're gonna see somebody very special and we're gonna visit Philippe Dufour. Wow. No way! Yeah. Yes! Wow. Way! Oh yeah. <laughs> yes. Mr. Philippe Dufour crossed by himself and all by hand the watches that come out of his workshop. And when I say all, well, I guess you can easily figure out by yourself that this means only a few watches per year. And today we will experience a rather surprising and emotional moment for one of the guys as a very, very rare camera came into the picture and provoked quite some reaction. But don't worry, this is still linked to watchmaking. But before getting to know better Mr. Dufour, let's come back on the notion of traditional watchmaking. What does it mean in contrast to industrial watchmaking? When one talks about traditional watchmaking, the notion of the human hand is simply prevailing and this at all stages of the manufacturing process. Whether cutting or polishing parts, assembling and adjusting the movement, decorating it, well, it's the human hand that will facet the watch and give it this strong and unique artistic dimension. We showed you a very clear example of this in our Patek Philippe Museum episode, where the huge majority of the watch and scene there were done at a time where machines simply didn't exist. With industrial watchmaking, well I guess you guessed it, but most if not all the watch is done using machines. But it would be too easy to simply oppose uh, both notions, traditional versus industrial, because the idea of good execution is as important on both sides. To give you an example, a Rolex is an industrial product, but it's well executed. They've invested millions in making their industrial processes as good as they could be, and at the end you get a good product and nobody tries to make you believe that a solitary watchmaker has been manufacturing your submariner up his little mountain. So it's fair and square, but obviously there is less poetry compared to a craftsman who devoted his time and effort in making your timepiece by hand. This gives it a complete different feel and this transpires through the object itself. That's what makes traditional watchmaking so emotional and filled with substance, as one can relate to the times where some hundred years ago, human ingenuity demonstrated itself once again by transforming an intangible concept, time, into a mechanical object. Rather impressive, no? And even if we live in a more and more digital world, I think it will still remain impressive. So this is what Mr. Dufour represents. So listen to the man, and how did he get into watchmaking? First, I was born in the Vallée du Jour a long time ago. At school, when I was 14, 15, I was more interested in, uh, in girlfriend than in, uh, in mathematics, okay? Uh, but I, I used to love the languages. So at the age of 15, my parents told me, you are not made uh, for the university, you know? You have to choose a profession. I was uh, playing with an old bike and I said, okay, I want to go to the technical school to learn mechanics. I went for the exam. And the result is, your head and your hands are working fine together, but mathematics are not so good. So, they say you are just good enough to be a watchmaker. <laughs> so, to tell you, I didn't choose my profession. You start to make your own watch, a school watch, you know. First, you, you, <coughs> you file the bridges, you drill, you, you create something. And then you, you make some gears, you know, crown wheel, ratchet wheel, and when you put it for the first time in the white and the movement and they're meshing together, it's just magic, you know. And since then, I never came out, you know. <laughs> it's how, how I started. Something very interesting about Mr. Dufour's career is that he's seen it all. He worked in more industrial configuration, he's also lived and worked abroad, he's gone through the huge watchmaking crisis of the mid-70s. Well, his understanding of watchmaking is very transversal, which makes his opinion and experience even richer. Let's hear more. Watches from uh, 1800, 1920. For me, it's the best period in terms of technical watches. The, the early watches, it's okay, but when you restore a watch like that, you can expect just to make tic-tac. <laughs> yeah, no accuracy, nothing, you know, because it was not done for that. Well, uh, meeting Mr. Dufour was, uh, I mean, a dream come true, you know. Uh, it's, uh, 
It's like uh, meeting Leonardo da Vinci. To hear his story, I thought was really interesting. It was very impressive to see his little workshop in the middle of, of nowhere, almost. Um, and the things he does in that small house without really any technology, no computers, no CNC, nothing really uh, that the rest of the watchmakers use is, is very impressive. And you can tell that he's someone who has just dedicated his entire existence and his being into his work. And that's um, something I respect. This is one experience I cannot forget because uh, I was actually anticipating or hoping that during this uh, watchmaking road trip we would meet him because I've been uh, obviously in my hobby researching the man and his quest for uh, going back in time and creating watch timepieces the same way uh, uh, the, the, the people used to do it before him and the fact that it's a lost art. I can tell you it was like a trip down memory lane. Immediately the smell of the tobacco, uh, the openness of uh, the man to receive us. All this is gone. You know, nothing is better. He was honest, he was forthcoming, he, he was inclusive. The way he was perched against a, a work table and, and telling his story, I felt immediately at home. Uh, this experience taught me that uh, to understand purely a watch, I need to, you know, know the guy who makes it, how he makes it, what he uses, uh, his philosophy, his history, and that gives me uh, value to the actual watch. And, uh, you know, it, I already seen everything about Philippe Dufour, so I knew it back in my mind, I knew it. But to see it in real and to see him just, uh, you know, work or touch something was uh, unestimated. Instead of, you know, showing like a piece or talking to the actual guy. That for me is uh, something you cannot buy. You cannot go, you know, on the shop uh, in the next 20 minutes and buy. That is the experience. Everyone was listening very religiously to Mr. Dufour and even more so when he started to talk more specifically on the watches he produces with his very own name on them. The watch I made, the, 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 the Jolite, it's, it's one, one watch with two escapements. Every hour is divided by two. And then, uh, year 2000, 1999-2000, I, I made a, a simplicity. And how, how the simplicity was born, it's uh, one of my friends is uh, Prezuzio, Antoine Prezuzio from Geneva. One day he told me, why don't you make a, a watch for the Japanese market? I said, well, yeah, why? He said, you know, you are well known in Japan. It's a fan club du four in Tokyo. I said, but I never sold a watch in Japan. He said, but, but <laughs> the people don't know about it, yeah? Okay, I said, I'm going to make a simple watch, okay? It was two ways to make it. Either, like everybody, pick up my phone, call Le Mania, Frédéric Piguet. Can you make me movement, 100 movement, with my name on it? Okay, you give to somebody else for the doll, the case and everything. You put in the box, you make invoices. You can make money, but short time money. Because, in fact, I would have destroyed what I tried to build. Okay. I said, no, 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 I'm going to design the movement. I'm going to design the watch. And I designed the first one. Here is it. It's the one you're wearing right now. Exactly, I will show you. It's the only watch I can afford. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's true. And this is a simplicity. I launched it in, in 2000. The beveling, round beveling. Why round beveling? Uh, it's it's a bit headache, but uh, it's more difficult to do. But why? Because if you have a, a 45 degree bevel, the light is shining only in one position. Here, here. All the rest is black. Okay. Now, if you have a, a, a Bombay, it's always shining. The light is always shining, and and, and and you can feel something. You can see something. Okay. Now the edges. Sharp edges, uh, corners, inside corners, detail of the screw, you know. I, I, I don't want to count the, the, the price of the screw because the, <laughs> it's just crazy, but it, but it has to be like that, you know. And also the Geneva way is very, very smooth. Today we don't see that anymore, you know. It's uh, very, very sharp and it's very uh, edges like that, you know. It's, okay. We naturally got to tour his workshop where he explained us and showed us how he works and he even let us have a go on some of his tools. 
mixed success for the guys, but they tried their best and at least had some fun doing it, while grasping at the same time how the hand represents this unique tool that will give the watch its unique personality. Almost. We continued our little tour and something really bizarre started to occur. As I could feel next to me, Sam getting more and more excited. Seriously excited. What was going on? This I camera <laughs> was made in the 30s by, by Lecoultre for Compass. You have the filters, the diaphragm, you have uh, even uh, you know, for the sun. Everything is here and you, you wind it. I don't remember how. Yeah, here. Like yeah, a whole mechanic, yeah. And then you, this one. See, you have different speed, of course. And um, you have a, a nice thing to make panorama, you know. It's all the, by, uh -huh. by degrees here. And it's all decorated as well. Where, where, where are you from? Uh, England. England, uh, yeah. okay. But, but I've, I've read about, I've, Always been in photography as long as I can remember. Yeah, yeah. And I, I remember reading about this yeah. and then understanding who it was made by and how few of them were made. And I thought, yeah, that is that is the, the best looking and the best sort yeah. of in terms of manufacture. Forget Leica and, and Hasselblad yeah, and everything. Yeah. This is this is something yeah. genuinely special. And I never yeah. ever thought that I'd be able to actually yeah. see one. And I'm uh, yeah. really, I, I don't really know what to say to be honest. And I'm, <laughs> so it wasn't a watch that made him go totally bonkers, but it was still related to watchmaking. Another great example of how these incredible micro-engineering skills can be transposed to other forms of mechanical art. It's a 19-line uh, Grand Sonnery Mini Tribune. It's not decorated yet. Maybe one day I will finish. I don't know when, but, but I mean, it's, work, it's working, okay? Release. And two, three years ago, I wanted to make an update. And they told me, yo, yo, yo. He was very kind. He showed us everything, told us his entire life story, opened safes, pulled out watch after watch after watch, let me wear his watch for more than an hour in the room. Um, the, one, the one he made and, and wears himself every day. And so uh, he didn't mind. He let me try his machines. Um, I failed, uh, but I tried nonetheless. And uh, he wasn't, disappointed, he didn't make you feel bad, he made you feel welcome and uh, like someone he wanted to you know, share his, his story and his, his crafts with and it was, it was very enjoyable. Something very dear to Mr. Dufour is this notion of transmission of knowledge and one of his biggest fears is precisely the fact that we are losing some of these skills. They need to be documented and passed on to the next generation of watchmakers. Something that he tries to promote as much as possible, for instance with the Naissance d'une Monde project done in collaboration with Global Français, where the idea is to follow and assist a watchmaker in producing his own school watch from scratch using only traditional watchmaking methods and tools. He's doing things the way it has been done 200 years ago. And when we talk about high-end watchmaking, when we go to museums, that's what we look at. We don't look at anything drilled with a CNC machine or finished with machines. You look at products that were finished purely by hand. And uh, as he says, you know, a machine cannot do what the hand can do. And uh, once you look at his watches and his timepieces and the way he finishes them and the way he pours all his emotion in them and the time he takes to polish every single part, whether it may be a screw or something you don't even see in the case back, just for self-satisfaction to be able to say, I delivered a perfect piece. You can understand his point of view and his perspective on watchmaking. And it's good to see all sides of watchmaking, you know? Uh, he wishes every watchmaker today that comes out of school, instead of uh, focusing on polishing or cutting some pieces, does it like the old days and essentially builds a clock from scratch. He tends to think that once you get more than one apprentice, once there's a lot of production involved, that sort of skill deteriorates because there's a lot of people putting their work in that watch and by doing it single-handedly then it becomes perfect and it's a shame because the gentleman is of senior age and uh, it would be sad to see that level of experience disappearing from the watch industry. So this was it for this very special visit and we all went to have a great lunch by the lake, Mr. Dufour, the road trippers and the technical crew included, before we would hit it off from the Vallée de Joux direction La Chaux-de-Fonds, another very typical watchmaking destination. 
See you soon in our next episode where you'll get to know a bit better our six participants and talk about their watchmaking taste. And all this naturally in beautiful postcard territory. See you soon. Merci.